My name is Pietro Passarelli. I was a Nine Mozilla Fellow with um, Vox Media in New York last year. Uh, my talk was about how do you make tools that your users are going to be excited about if you're not the main expert in that area. I'm here to talk to you about a product that I built last year and some of the lessons learned from building tools in the newsroom. Um, so last year I did a, a 10 months fellowship with the, um, with the Vox product team as part of the Knight Mozilla Foundation fellowship with uh, Open News. And um, my background is a little mixed. Like I come from a mixed background where I've done anthropology initially, then I did, um, uh, I worked in documentary film production with the BBC. Um, I then did a master in computer science because I was interested in the convergence between video and software. And I also worked as a newsroom developer before joining this. The reason why I'm giving you like this kind of whirlwind overview of my background is because th those are some of the things that influence the way I approach building products. And so these are where I got some of the lessons learned that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, so the, the product I built is called AutoEdit. Uh, it's uh, freely available and open source, uh, so you can check it out if you're interested. And it's for editing video interview. So it's a way of like very quickly edit video interviews and make video production faster, easier, and more accessible. Um, in this fir in the, the first version that was released, it was downloaded around 700 times. And it's a desktop application for, for the Mac. Uh, what it does is that using the transcriptions automatically generated by um, IBM Watson, you're able to make selections and then get a video sequence that you can use in your video editing software of choice. Um, it takes about five minutes to get a transcription, regardless of how long the media is. And um, you can use it in multiple different languages, the ones that are supported by IBM. Um, Spanish is included. And you can also use it offline uh, using another open source speech to text engine that is in there. And it can also be used for captioning, but if you're interested in captioning, come and talk to me afterwards because I'm building a separate product to do that, which is a bit more tailored to that use case. And the most important part of the, the process is that if you're working with video interviews for documentary production, uh, this allows you to select transcriptions from multiple uh, interviews and then combine them together and you can also view a preview of those selections and see what that's uh, gonna look like before exporting into the video sequence. Uh, so the outcome of the project is that uh, it increases the speed at which you can do editing of video interviews. It increases the story quality that you can work on. So it allows you to concentrate at the level of the story crafting and allows you to make better stories. Um, it increases the collaboration so you can collaborate with people at the level of the content of what you're working on, so between video producers and journalists and other folks involved in the process. And the, um, the people making the stories don't necessarily need to know how to use a video editing software. You can get to the rough cut stage without needing to know how to use it or actually having it available. Um, so this is like one of the feedback that we got from the initial prototypes um, with the Vox uh, producers. And so then the question is, um, if you're not a domain expert in a certain area, how do you go about making a tool that people are gonna be excited about and they're gonna want to be using and they're gonna be like, uh, you know, um, talking to other people and then it's gonna get adopted by, by others. So these are some of the things that I, um, I wanna share with you that I think could be useful if you're doing this type of things. Uh, so the first thing is like to think about user research. Uh, so the biggest challenge with user research is how do you get like useful intel from your users? Like how do you get information that is actually actionable and you can do something with it to build the product? There are a few things that you can consider when doing user research, uh, like a few sort of techniques. One is the lean methodology, which has got a focus on like learning and iteratively making hypotheses, testing those hypotheses, and basically like the focus is not about making a finished product, but the focus is on learning as much as possible about what would work for your users in terms of solutions. The other thing you want to be thinking about is identifying your early adopters. And that's something that it's okay to spend some time doing because it will pay up in the, in the long run. Um, another technique uh, which comes from like anthropology is the idea of like participant observation. So in the case of video production, for example, if you can spend some time um, with your video producers and look at how they do video 
um, and just like be involved in one of their videos and see what, what it takes to do it, and maybe do one of the lower level jobs so that you can be a part of that. Then you get like a first hand experience and you really see for yourself. Um, there's also the concept of uh, what they call the mom test, which comes from like the lean methodology world, which is the idea that um, if you ask someone like, would you use an app that does this and that, they might tell you, yeah, sure, why not? But if you ask them like in the past, like, have you used an app for this type of problem, then that gives you like a more actionable um, answer that you can do things with it because then you're using basically past, past behavior as a predictor of future success. So you're rooting your quest in the past. Routing your questions in the past allows you to uh, get more useful information from them. Um, and then there's kind of the idea of user-centered design that is something you want to be considering in building personas. Personas are like abstract characteristics of your users that you can use to start to shape and understand what are the needs and what kind of things they um, could be interesting for them. Uh, the, the last thing I want to urge you on user research is to have like a healthy distrust for questionnaires. I've seen it way too many times that people just write a questionnaire and send it out and then they just take it uh, for gold what they get back from the users. But if you do have to do a questionnaire, then you can use the sort of like mom test, mom test technique and like root your questions in the past and try to get more actionable stuff. And it's a great tool to get, to identify early adopters, but I wouldn't rely too much on it. Um, so if you're a domain expert, that's fantastic, but if you're not, that's okay. What do I mean by a domain expert? A domain expert is someone that understands the complexity and contradiction of a field um, and basically is able to juggle that complexity in their mind when thinking about it. So um, if you're not a domain expert in a specific field or a specific area or something you want to work on, the something you can do about it is that you can identify what is the domain, so what are the limits of the thing that you're looking at. Um, you can identify expert views and do some research and find out like, for example, in the case of uh, video interviews, paper editing, so doing it with like printed transcriptions, scissors, tape, uh, that's still considered a best practice. But then what you want to be thinking about is how do your users feel about it? Like do your users accept these expert views, these best practices, or do they criticize them uh, or they have mixed feelings about it? Like again, going back to the example of video editing, um, video editors don't really like to work with text and transcriptions if we're generalizing. But producers and journalists, uh, story scripts are like their bread and butter. So um, that's something to think about when you're thinking about who your users are and how you're going to position your, your tools and solutions to them. Um, the other thing that I'm quite adamant about is that your users might not always know what is best for them. So you cannot really expect to get all the knowledge you need to build the tool from the users, which is why you want to be looking at like best practices and domain experts. Um, but at the same time, you also want to always remember that your users will be uh, the one that know what is important to them. So you really need to le learn about that and figure that out. Another thing that helps with the development is to be language agnostic. So if you try and build your tool, you want to like figure out what is the best technology to fix the to, to solve the specific problem um, and see what is mo most appropriate and factor in the learning curve to, to do that. So when you're picking the right stack, you don't want to be doing this. You don't want to be like having to like change what you're using every so often because th things keep changing uh, under your feet. What you want to be doing is identifying what are the evergreen skills and sort of techniques and best practices in the computer science world, and then within those, kind of like go for that so that you know the latest framework is going to change very quickly, but the underlying things are not going to change as fast. So if you go for that approach, um, you have like a more solid foundation to work on. Uh, an example of like sort of the language agnostic approach is that uh, when I did the first version of AutoEdit, um, I used like um, Ruby on Rails and uh, SQL database. So I was thinking like in terms of database terms on how to structure my data. And that meant that the lines were all like my, my smallest unit that you could use to create your selections. And that meant that it was very clunky and there was no way of like selecting words that were not within a line. So when I then did the new version and thought about using a NoSQL database, I was freed up from that constraint and I was able to like uh, really just think about what is the best experience for the users and how to approach that on the front end and build that and allow that granularity at the, at the word level. Um, so, you know, as the popular saying goes, if you have a hammer, everything becomes a nail. Um, and you should always try to put your user needs first. So 
Uh, I've seen this many times that people have a certain technology they want to build stuff with and they go out and they try to find a use case for that. That is a really hard approach. Like if instead you put everything you learn technology-wise aside, then you go on and learn about your users, you learn about what they do, what it is their problems, what are the things that they're looking to, to, to get fixed, then you start with those user needs. You might not need all the technology you know, but if you start with the user needs and then figure out a technology stack, you can get a much better fit and a much better solution that is gonna get traction for your product. Um, an approach that has been quite successful is that of like mapping the problem domain. So as an example, if you're building like a route planning application, uh, what you want to be doing is that instead of like just doing one route with a list of instructions, if you build a map as a system and you define how you create the different um, strategies to create routes, then that is gonna take a little longer to get set up, but it's gonna be a lot more flexible when you need to add multiple routes or the users are querying for like different um, locations or ways to go to places. While if you're going for the first approach where every time you have to write the list, that means that it's not gonna scale very well because it's just gonna be bloated with instructions as you go forward. Um, if you use a components-based uh, design, that's gonna help to make things modular. It's gonna help you like keeping things uh, small, keeping things simple, and also having reusable stuff if you do a new product uh, to kind of move on to the, be able to reuse it and get up and running a lot faster if you're staying in the same problem domain. Um, if you use a kind of like an R&D research and development approach, or at least this is kind of like my take on R&D approach, uh, first thing to do is like after you're done user research is to identify what is the workflow. So this is like an analog paper edit. Like this is actually like, you know, paper and scissors and tape and I did a bunch of workshops where I got people to do it and I observed them doing it and I learned from like what were the pain points in doing the traditional workflow without even going into the digital one. And that helped me to like really define what does it take to, to do a paper edit in the analog way. And then from that, you can identify what are the parts and components that make up the workflow. So these are a bunch of different techniques by, you know, sketch prototypes, system interactions, and others uh, that you can use. And then from that, you can go to like low fidelity and high fidelity. Like the high fidelity mockups in this case is a HTML JavaScript that is just like a dummy demo. It's just to kind of showcase what, what this would look like. It's more like a proof of concept than a working version. Um, it's not a question of like if you're gonna get stuck in the development, it's more of a question of when you're gonna get stuck, generally speaking, when you're building something new. So it really helps to learn how to formulate questions. So the idea is like you're stuck because something unexpected happened and if you think about the limits of what you know, uh, what you don't know, the limits of what you don't know, then you start to really shape the boundaries of your knowledge and the problem. And then on top of that, if you write it all down, identify the, spend some time identifying what is the vocabulary to describe your system, then that allows you to make some hypotheses about what are the root causes and our experiment to test it out and figure out what is the problem. Uh, this can help you like narrow down the problem and kind of like move on and find like a way to communicate it to others and get yourself out of the, the block and go towards like a solution. I would also really encourage you to be brave like Pixar. So there's this amazing documentary about like Pixar and the making of Toy Story. And um, what happened there is that the Woody character, it didn't work in the first version. It was like cynical and nasty and like the story didn't work and they were like three days from the deadline. And what did they decide to do? They decided to trash the whole thing, put everything away and start over from scratch until they got the story to work to be able to like move forward. So it takes some guts to do that, but if you have done all the kind of things that I've talked to before, mapping the problem domain, component-based design, and so on, you're only really throwing away the kind of physical representation of your idea, and you're not really starting from scratch, but you have like the, the excitement of a blank canvas, and uh, sometimes in certain projects, that really helps to be able to like just not have the, the weight of what you've done before um, oppress you when you're trying to make decisions. Um, something that I've been thinking about a lot is uh, the kind of debate human versus machine type of situation. So in 1997, we had IBM uh, being able to beat like a chess player with their machine. And in 2016, so last year, IBM Watson was able to edit the video trailer. So this raises a lot of questions around like what is happening with 
um, you know, all these services, especially cognitive services. What is the role of these tools that we're building? Are we trying to replace people's work? Are we trying to enhance people's work? Like, these are things that you need to be thinking about. You cannot just leave this as an afterthought. In the case of auto-edit, like, my personal take on this is that you have at the top of this diagram the traditional workflow, which is like really tedious and time consuming, and people are not doing much of it because of those reasons. And then you got the digital workflow. And a digital workflow is designed so that it can announce the human experience of making a great story. And it can really just be there to support and remove all the tediousness of the workflow and remove all the friction. So that was kind of my take. It wasn't like, let's try to automate as much as possible so that people don't have to make video, but let's try to make it so that when people make video, they can be empowered to make the best possible story and really shine through the story crafting process. Um, so basically, something to really think about, which is like my closing note, is convenience trumps quality every day of the week. That's something that you really want to be very clear about it with yourself and your team. So the idea there is that, what, I, what do I mean by that? I mean that we have a trend where we got high volume production with low quality output, and at the same time, it's also like low quality production with high volume distribution. So your job as a developer is to identify or the product manager or you know, person that makes tool, um, to identify what are the convenience hooks that you can use with your audience and your users, and then use those to increase the overall quality of the experience or the output of the process of what you're working on. But you cannot expect that quality alone is going to drive um, that the users are just going to be ex excited because you're giving them something that produces a high quality output. They're probably not going to be excited by that alone, but the convenience hook are, it's what is going to drive adoption and going to get them to like um, really buy in into your product. In the case of auto edit, for example, being able to get a transcription into f in five minutes to an around time was a very good convenience hook. And that meant that even though in five minutes transcription, because of technical reason, is not as good as if you wait like for a whole hour, it still meant that people were more excited about using it than waiting for like an hour. Um, yeah, that's it for my talk. Uh, these are the links to slides and the auto edit tool. Um, I also wrote a paper about this if you want to check it out in more details and feel free to ask me any questions about it afterwards. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to ask any questions. And before I forget, I have a workshop in the afternoon which is going to be about like how can we make annotated articles? Um, so like the ones that you see here on the, that you don't see on the screen, but the ones you might have seen on like New York Times, Vox, uh, NPR, yeah, the one you see over there. How can we make this without having to write a single line of code? And I'll tell you about my experience of like prototyping and building this. Um, and it works with like um, live stream of text from TV and other interesting, exciting technologies. Awesome. Thanks.